All right, we're firing on all cylinders. All right, let's see here. Hey guys, it's Matt here at Hall Precision. Hope you're all doing well. Enjoyed the holidays and uh, Happy New Year to you. It's currently January 3rd, about uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And I wanted to show you guys a project I've been working on. It's a uh, vacuum fixture design. Uh, meant to hold down a thin sheet of polycarbonate so that we can cut out a bunch of windows and holes from it. So um, this is my first venture into like a production vacuum plate. I have used others before that are just like the grid style where you set your own uh, gasket and then we use like an electric vacuum with a uh, reservoir tank and that sort of thing. And um, I wanted to get something that was a little bit more robust for these uh, production runs because right now we're only doing a couple hundred of these parts but um, hopefully in the future we do a lot more and I also just wanted a really reliable vacuum system for the shop so I went ahead and invested in a Pearson Work Holding Smart Vac 3. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. If you are unfamiliar with these head over to Pearson Work Holding. They have lots of resources, YouTube videos and that sort of thing and it's where I learned everything I learned about them until I got my hands on it and started learning other things. So um, the important thing to take away from this is that it's really simple. You have an air inlet, so you use compressed air, and it's like a Venturi pump system, I believe. And then you have an outlet, and that flow of air somehow creates a vacuum. I won't pretend to know how. Uh, so this one arrow shows that there's vacuum going to it. When you've achieved vacuum, this plunger will recess into the body and show that you have achieved full vacuum. So it's a really simple uh, part. I used to have a reservoir tank with a dial on it, uh, the vacuum gauge, and you literally have to wait until it got down to a certain <laughs> vacuum pressure before you could start. And that was like your indicator. You're just constantly looking up on top of the machine cabinet at this dial. And so this is a much simpler system, a little bit easier to know whether or not you've achieved vacuum. And um, they do say that it's not a high flow vacuum. Uh, but it does, it's a very consistent vacuum, it doesn't use very much power, so it's pretty efficient. So anyways, I picked up one of these. I also grabbed their starter kit, um, or connection kit. I've uh, been happy with it. I only had one problem with the magnet on the back side of this bracket. Uh, it was really weak, so if, if I just set it on my <laughs> machine enclosure and just leave it, it will really slowly start to slide down. Like that's how weak the magnet is. So what I did is I just took the regulator off of the bracket tape the bracket to the machine, and then put the regulator back on. So it's a little janky, but I just wanted to get something going. And it's one of those things like, I'm not gonna do something permanent to the machine or to the regulator uh, my first time using it, right? Because I'll probably need to go back and refine it. At that time, I can replace the magnet or you know, maybe even drill into the cabinet or create some kind of mount. This is gonna work a little bit better. So for now, it's taped on the machine. I also grabbed their slotting end mill. Um, this just makes it so much easier to cut these grooves. I mean, you can certainly use your own tooling and deburr it, but you literally just plunge this into the part and cut it at, what, 24 inches a minute, make your grooves. It's a one-pass thing. They come out great. They're deburred. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy. It's worth the 44 bucks. So I grabbed two of those in case I broke one. Didn't break one, though, so one's all you need. And I have a uh, $45 end mill for sale if anybody wants it. No. Um, I went ahead and ordered some of their eighth inch gasket as well, it's 50 feet, and I think I might have used 10% of that on this plate. Um, and last but not least, if you want to know how to design your own, you can come watch their video here. Um, I actually haven't watched this video in a long time, so I don't know if he's gonna say a lot of the tips that I used, uh, so maybe my video is pointless, maybe you can just watch this one and get all the same information. But anyways, uh, last thing I'll say is, um, if I were to do anything different about this process, I would implement the use of these single flute down cutting end mills. Right now we're just using a standard three flute uh, up cutting end mill, and so it tries to pull the plate away from the vacuum fixture, and um, I'll call it a sheet. It tries to pull the sheet away from the vacuum plate, and uh, when we're taking fast cuts, there's a high upward force, and it can cause the part to separate, and um, that's no good. So using one of these downward cutting, uh, single flute's got a lot of chip evacuation. Uh, should should make a 
big difference in feed rates and cycle times. So next time we run this job, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a couple of these and see how they do. But for now, we're using regular end mill. All right, let's look at the design of our vacuum plate. So there's a lot going on here. Um, I guess we'll look at the part first so you can see what that looks like. So this is the part, it's 330 seconds inch um, polycarbonate. It's about 10 by 17 inch uh, area. And um, there's absolutely no way you could hold on to this part with anything else besides like double stick tape. And we're doing hundreds of them. The double stick tape is just not an option. It's a lot of cleanup, it's a ton of tape. If I was doing a one-off double stick tape would probably be the way I'd go instead of making a full fixture plate. But uh, in volume, that's just not gonna work. So vacuum plate it is. And the kind of general tips with making a vacuum plate is you want to vacuum on as much surface area as you possibly can. So if I could clamp or vacuum on this entire blue surface area, which is 125 square inches, so 125 times 14 PSI, we would get 1,700 pounds of holding force on the part, right? Um, instead, we have to, let me turn off something really quick so we can do some math. So instead of vacuuming on the entire surface area of the part, we can only clamp on or vacuum on this area in green. And so if we look at what that area is, it's only 77 inches squared instead of uh, 125. So do 77 times 14. So it's 1,078 versus what, 1,700 PSI. So it's, um, I can't do math. So that's, you know, a 35% decrease in the holding pressure due to the areas that we have to exclude from the uh, vacuum area. So maximize the amount of vacuum area is the tip there. And so what we try to do is look at the perimeter of the part and create a gasket channel that is just inset from that perimeter. So basically what I did is I created this plate and then I projected the silhouette of the part onto the plate and then I offset 50 thousandths in and then created my groove from there. And again, that, if you, if you go to Pearson Work Holdings videos, he pretty much explains the same thing here, so I won't go into too much more detail about that. Um, same thing with this inner window. You'll notice it's red in here, so that means there's no vacuum applied to this area. So that's really where we're, where we're losing our vacuum force, and that's because there's all those through holes. If we had vacuum there and we cut through one of those holes, it would just create a leak and the part would come off of the plate. So, no bueno. Um, same thing with this little window cut out here. We have to uh, exclude the vacuum from that area, and um, that's pretty much it. So for the gasketing, keep it as close to the edge or the perimeter of your part as you can. Um, and I guess a good reason for that is, like if you imagine a gasket all along the bottom of this part, if I'm cutting the perimeter from the top side, that tool doesn't have very much mechanical leverage over the vacuumed area. But that vacuum area was only in the center of the part and I was coming around with the tool, it would be pulling it away really easily because there's nothing holding that edge down. And so you get all this mechanical leverage over the seal and then it breaks it, the part comes off. So keep that gasket as close to the edge as you can. Third thing is vent any areas that are sealed off. So you can imagine this little area here would be completely sealed off if I didn't have this hole in there. Um, let's go ahead and delete it. Nope, it's not gonna let me because I'm not editing the part. Let's do it just for sake of example. So if I didn't have a hole through there, um, that little pocket would have air trapped in it. And when I sucked the plate, the, the sheet down to the plate, you'd have this pocket of air that's trapped. And so what that does is it pushes against the vacuum force and that reduces your overall vacuum force. That's not good, right? So what we need to do is vent that hole so that any of the air trapped in it can vent out. And same thing goes for this inner area. That's actually a lot of air, and if you don't give that somewhere to vent, it will just push the part up. So you'll have Z height deviations, variations, and you'll also decrease your vacuum force. So vent any sealed off areas. The perimeter of the part, the outer edge of the part, is um, naturally vented, so you don't really need anything else for that. And then, I think tip four is what we're on, is um, try to keep the gaskets as far apart from each other as you can. 
don't have the math worked out for this exactly, but it seems to me like in areas where there's a very little surface area uh, for vacuum, but there's a high ratio of gasket to vacuum area, um, the vacuum force in that area will not be very strong compared to a big open area like this. So if it was possible for me to move this gasket and this gasket further apart so that the surface area between them is greater and therefore the vacuum holding is higher, uh, I would do so. Unfortunately, I'm restricted to uh, this specific geometry because of that window cutout. So just a tip, um, keep them as far apart as you can. Um, and then lastly, something that is not in here that I turned off earlier, uh, let me wait for my computer, is it's probably a good idea to add some vacuum vents into your plate. So you'll notice I have my vacuum inlet here and that is intersecting this hole on the top of the plate and that hole is being intersected by this groove. So this groove goes all the way around the plate and what I think was happening when I put my raw material on the plate is that in this area here and in this area here and possibly even this one and maybe even here, basically where it necks down to a really narrow area, I think this bottom section of green was getting a nice high vacuum, but then it would actually pull the part flush with the plate and then block any vacuum force from going beyond that. So basically everything from this section all the way up here and all the way over to here was blocked off from vacuum. And so I tested that by taking a Dremel and just creating a few grooves that intersected with my vacuum hole. And I just literally hand drew grooves around the plate, stuck a part on there and it seemed to help. Now I did that before I added these vents. And so my results on whether or not that was helpful were kind of inconclusive, but it makes sense to me that if the part is flexible, like polycarbonate sheet is, that it could potentially seal itself off on the plate and anything beyond those areas would not get adequate vacuum. So I just went ahead and went ham with it and made grooves everywhere. Now, if you have a vacuum plate that has a grid pattern in it, this is already naturally done. And there's some debate as to whether or not that helps with vacuum force. Um, I don't know if this helped or not, but it doesn't hurt. So I just went ahead and added it. So those are kind of the five key points. Uh, maximize your vacuum area, keep your gaskets as far away from each other as you can, make sure you vent any areas that are sealed, add grooves, and I'm sure I'm forgetting the other one. Rewind the video if you need to uh, know what that is. <laughs> All right, so one tip for actually manufacturing the part is your outer contour. Um, it might be a good idea to turn on feed optimization. Again, this is due to the tooling that we're using. If we had a downward cutting end mill, it would probably be better, but uh, we are using an upward cutting end mill. So in the corners, I don't know if it's a matter of like, maybe there's a higher tool engagement rate on corners or something, but it seems like the pull force is way higher in corners, uh, inner and outer than it is on just a straightaway. So what I did is in my feed optimization is I reduced the feed rate on corners. So if I can hide my body here, you can see that in the straightaways it's blue, meaning that's the standard feed rate, 36 inches a minute. And then when it turns yellow, it's reduced the feed rate to nine inches a minute. And in this corner and this one specifically, it seemed to really help with the part pull up. It does take a little bit longer, it adds about two minutes to the cycle time. Um, luckily I've already beaten the projected cycle time, but, uh, if this took a whole lot longer, I'd probably have to look at getting those new tools rather than trying to slow down the corner feed rate. So again, a new tool, uh, downward cutting single flute would probably reduce this issue and I could probably get away with that, um, feed optimization, but since I don't have one, this is the workaround. So you'll also notice I have a manual NC stop. Let me turn everything back on here. So um, this is the first operation. And then after that, I have an NC stop, which is basically an MO, and then I put a note underneath it to remove the drop. So this whole chunk that is machined off of the part needs to be removed from the machine because later on I have other operations. And I also have a fan that comes out and blows off the part. I don't want this big flimsy chunk of plastic flying around inside the enclosure. So we have an MO. You go to the machine, remove the piece of stock, press the green button, and we're back in business.
So after that, we come out and do all the holes. Um, there are some little drops here, but it's really not a big deal. The coolant blows them away. And then a deber, and at last a fan. So again, if this drop was still here, when this fan came out, it blow it around and cause all sorts of problems. So um, we just go ahead and have that MO to remove it beforehand. Has a little bit more to the cycle time, but it's safer. So anyways, um, that's pretty much it for the design and a couple little programming tips. Um, as designed, this has been working really well. It's super consistent and um, I can confidently walk away from the machine knowing the part is not gonna come off the table. So that said, let's go see it in action.